Okay, I will be the first to admit that I don't have a lot of experience with interpreting ECGs. Um, and I'm not all knowing about these, but I want to talk about a few different patterns and I'm talking about them in relationship to helping you understand how the ECG is really working. The first thing we'll start with is if I were to do kind of just a quick rough sketch of the heart. Okay. And my SA node being here, my bundles, um, my, my internodal pathways like so. My bundles have his um, left and, and then the Bukinji fibers like so. So this is just my quick rough sketch here. One of the challenges that we can sometimes have, and there's a number of different causes for this, we can get um, spontaneous pacemakers being generated. And this is essentially when the cardiac muscle essentially decides to become its own pacemaker. And in that particular si situation, we alter the electrical transduction of the, um, from the SA node to the AV node. And we can end up with what we call uh, either partial or complete blocks in terms of that electrical flow. We can get things as simple as just slowing down that interval. Um, we can get these very odd circular circuits that essentially loop back on it themselves and then spontaneously break free. Um, and so we end up getting these unique looking action potentials. And I'm uh, not action potentials, ECGs. And so if we were to look at just some examples of those, um, one of the things that there's different degrees of block. There's first degree block, and that one's kind of hard to pick out uh, because essentially the ECG looks like a pretty normal ECG, okay? But the interval um, between the P wave and the QRS complex, this interval here, um, essentially ends up being delayed. And that's essentially because the electrical signal is having a harder time, for whatever reason, reaching that AV node. And so we get a slight delay in that regard, um, but otherwise it's going to look like a fairly normal ECG. Let me exaggerate that delay a little bit. There we go. Whoops. Right all about a cube. There you go. Sorry, that looks really ugly. But that's basically the idea here is that this segment here is going to be delayed. So that would be first degree bundle block. Correction, first degree block. There's a difference between bundle block and block. First degree, if just block, refers to the SA node to the AV node, whereas bundle block usually refers to what's happening in the bundles of Hiss. Now, second degree block, what we end up seeing is this progressive, maybe it looks normal at first, a little too long there, sorry, T waves fine, and then what we end up getting is this progressively longer Progressively longer, good heavens, stupid thing. Sorry guys. Okay, here's my T wave. And then we're gonna have my P wave. And now we have an even longer interval. And that will continue until the QRS complex is completely dropped. We skip one. And that would be our second degree block. Third degree block is the most serious. And this is the one that, in my opinion, is most useful for helping us understand um, what's happening in terms of the ECG and more importantly about those pacemaker cells and how each of these pacemaker cells by themselves will have an, an, their own rhythm. They coordinate the SA node, coordinates the function of those nodes, but in their absence, so let's imagine in this case, um, perhaps we don't have a P wave at all, Okay. Or maybe we have a little P wave, but there's no relationship at all between that P wave 
and the QRS complex. And the reason this happens is, is there's absolutely no communication. So if we go back up here, there's no communication at all between the SA node and the AV node. It's not, they're not talking. And so consequently, the reason we get a QRS wave at all is because this is when the AV node decides on its own to fire. And so we are essentially putting the AV node in charge of ventricle depolarization uh, and taking the SA node completely out of the picture. Um, this will occur in this uh, third degree block. If we were to have, for example, another common condition, atrial fibrillation, and that's usually when we get a bunch of electrical um, hot spots, for lack of a better word, in the atria, and they're all sending their own little signals, and so the muscle is essentially spasming in the atria, and we're not getting any contraction of that atria, no coordinated contraction. And what that looks like is in instead of a P wave, we get this crazy um, signal, and that's called fibrillation. And in that case, we're not, again, not talking between SA node and AV node, but we're not even getting contraction of the atria in this case. And um, again, we're still going to get a QRS complex, but that is because of the AV node. That's what decides to generate that complex. Now, people with AFib live all the time, but they're not going to be able to handle a lot of exertion. Um, they're they're going to struggle a little bit um, because the AV node, again, is only going to beat about 60 beats per minute. And if you're somebody like me who really needs it to be beating at 80 beats per minute, that's not going to happen. And so there's a decreased ability to supply tissue with oxygen, and that does hamper physical activity. There's also higher risk of stroke in those cases or cardiac or myocardial infarction or pulmonary embolism. Um, the next one I want to talk about is what happens when the Purkinje fiber essentially takes over. And that gets back, if we go up here, um, what we can get is what we call bundle block. So bundle block is different than block. Okay, so bundle block refers to blocking to the bundle of his. And we can get a, com a blockage of that common pathway or alternatively, we could get a partial block in the left or a partial block in the right. Each of them are going to give us slightly different patterns. I'm going to go with the common. This is the one we're going to look at just to make our lives easier because the ECG gets progressively more com complicated and you, and I'm not a cardiologist. Let's, let's face that. I'm not even an EMT. I'm just somebody who's learned about this so that I can explain it to you. Um, so. In the situation where we have like a partial block, so let's say the, um, this time our P wave and our Q QRS, they're talking to each other. There's nothing wrong with the electrical um, signal that is traveling from the AV node to the QRS, okay? Um, whoops. So we're going to get that. Oh, now I have to stop and think for a second. Okay, yes, let me change this. So yes, we are going to get communication. AV node and SA node are talking. AV node fires just fine. But in order to get that QRS plot complex, so even though the AV node is firing, that signal, that electrical signal, has to travel down the bundle block. If we have a partial delay, what we might see is simply, again, a delay in terms of getting my QRS. And so that might not be too easy to distinguish from other blocks. But if instead of a partial delay, we have a complete block, now we're going to get something really strange going on. We might get several P waves. 
because there's no problem with that SA node. It's generating these action are these uh, depolarizing waves and the and we're getting these P waves and we're getting the atria contracting. But the ventricle in a complete bundle block, the ventricle no longer is listening to the AV node because there's no message getting from the AV node to Purkinje fibers. That's stopped. Um, there's there's something in the way, there's an obstruction of some sort, some damaged tissue, no signal. So does that mean we just never generate a QRS wave? Are we dead? No, we're not very healthy. But we do in fact generate a QRS wave. But this time, instead of generating it every 60 beats per minute, we're generating it every 40 beats per minute, 30 to 40 beats per minute. And why? Because now our Purkinje fibers are in charge of ventricle contraction. You're not going to be very happy here. You're going to be pretty darn sick. Um, you get progressively, depending on the severity of the, of the blockage and the electrical conduction pathway of the heart, the sicker you, you are. Now, we've evolved some marvelous technology, and we can place artificial pacemakers here. And what they are is essentially this wiring system. And so depending on where the block is, let's say we have a blockage between the SA node and the AV node, just for kicks and giggles. So we can go in here and we can insert, insert a system of wires attached to a battery pack, and we get these pulses being generated artificially. So we can have that type of pacemaker. More commonly, didn't mean to erase the whole thing, but okay. More commonly, we're going to generate a signal um, if we have like say complete bundle lock, we're gonna generate a signal that essentially bypasses that bundle of hiss. And so our electrical wires will essentially be connecting artificial, artificial pacemakers, but we're gonna connect essentially to those bundles of hiss like so through these wires and then we're going to fire those um, at a rhythm through this pacemaker. So we have learned to compensate for some of these cardiac issues. Uh, but it's pretty interesting to know and to kind of think about why we get certain patterns in the ECG. Now if I show you, let me go to here, if I'm going to show you some ECGs um, that you can actually look at and again I'm not Okay, so here I'm going to show you some examples of some ECGs, and I don't want to get into them too, too much. This is just more of kind of familiarizing yourself with some common patterns that we might see. What you're looking at here is called the normal sinus rhythm. This is in the healthy heart, assuming everything works perfectly. We have a normal um, pattern and uh, a normal rhythm, so about 60 beats per minute to 100 beats per minute, depending whatever is normal for ourselves. Sinus bradycardia refers to a heartbeat that is too slow. Um, sometimes sinus bradycardia is, is perfectly normal. Let's say you're an athlete, you're an endurance runner, for example. You've strengthened your heart, and your heart has become much more efficient. And you can use move the same amount of blood with your heart beating at 54 beats per minute that somebody else might need 80 beats per minute for and it's due to this efficiency. And so in that case, you might have sinus bradycardia, but it's not a pathological state. Um, in other situations, it, it's, um, essentially just your heart is just working too slow, and there's a variety of things that could be causing that, excessive parasympathetic nervous system activity um, as being just one of those situations. The opposite of bradycardia is sinus tachycardia. And sinus, by the way, means that the pro that well, it's not so much the problem, but the SA node is firing too fast in this case. And this gives us a rapid heart rate. Again, tachycardia is perfectly normal if we're running on a treadmill or we're exercising. But if we are at rest and we have this rapid heartbeat, it might um, instead indicate that um, maybe we have overly active sympathetic nervous system. Maybe we're experiencing anxiety. Maybe um, something else is wrong. And again, I you know I don't know everything about ECGs, so I don't know all the possibilities there. But this would be sinus tachycardia. Here's that first degree heart block that I was talking about. 
So this would mean we have a problem with transmission of electrical signals from the SA node to the AV node. And you can see that um, what you're really looking for when you look at this is essentially just this delay right here. Um, and so based on that signal, um, that's essentially what tells you that, hey, you know, we've got a little bit of a problem here uh, at the beginning of this blockage between the SA node and the AV node. Second degree block, as I mentioned, this one's interesting in that we have a progressively long, so look here, which is fairly long. Uh, you notice this one's even longer. And then eventually it just becomes so long that look, we, we skipped, we completely skipped a QRS wave right here. And then we basically start over with it, you know, really, really short and then getting progressively longer and longer and then longer again until we skip that QRS wave again. And so that would be second, uh, second degree block. Here's the third degree block. Now this is essentially uh, when there's absolutely no relationship between the P wave and the QRS. So here's my little P wave, do do do, and then that's not doing anything. The electrical signal doesn't travel from the SA node to the AV node, there's a blockage there, and so consequently um, we might be getting uh, atrial depolarization, but we're certainly not having, there's no way for the SA node to tell the AV node it's time to contract. So what are these? These are the AV nodes saying, hey, let's contract. And so it's the rhythm of the AV node that allows for those to be generated. Supraventricular tachycardia, this is essentially a really fast rhythm that um, originates above the bundled branches. So this would be the AV node going crazy, maybe. Or maybe you have a, the generation of a new pacemaker um, that is above those bundled branches. But we get this AV node firing too fast or this new pacemaker firing too fast. And so the atria is filing normally normal rhythm from the atria. It's beating at 72 beats per minute. But meanwhile, the ventricle is like contracting like crazy, just mad madness. Um, and so that's supraventricle tach tachycardia. Here's a fibrillation, which I talked about. And you can see these crazy patterns here um, as we get these electrical pulses um, being generated. Now notice the unusual rhythm of the QRS complexes too. Um, and this is because sometimes in the fibrillation, as we have this electrical energy bouncing somewhat randomly, um, maybe it's not completely randomly, but throughout the atria, every now and then that electrical pulse will escape and make it to the AV node and trigger the QRS wave. But you can see that it's, it's somewhat random as to whether that wave um, escapes to uh, generate this irregular heart rhythm that we can see with atrial fibrillation. Atrial flutter is something different. Uh, we end up with multiple uh, P waves for each QRS complex. I don't actually know much about this other than say this this is characterized by this soft tooth pattern. I don't actually know really in terms of causes what's the difference between uh, fibrillation and flutter. Maybe somebody else smarter than me knows. And then last, this is, <laughs> you're dying. This is time to get out the paddles to shock you. Um, this is ventricle fibrillation. And in this case, you don't have a pulse. This is be when, if you are, uh, you know, you come across somebody in ventricle fibrillation um, and you have one of those AEDs, this automatic, um, anyway, AEDs to, resuscitate, you can place those electrodes on their skin and administer a shock. Um, and it might be able to reset the electrical pulses of the heart. There's no guarantee, of course. Um, somebody in ventricular fibrillation is dying. And so in this case, uh, it's always worth a try. You might save them, but it, it's important to be aware that there's also a good chance that you won't. Um, CPR can keep that heart beating well, manually, squishing it um, and save time. So if you come across somebody who doesn't have a heart rate, you can buy time until somebody gets there with an AED. But CPR, unlike what you see in the movie, CPR is not going to restart the heart um, 
if you're in ventricle fibrillation. You, you need one of those AED devices. And that's it.